Hey, welcome back to the Home Tech Experience. I'm glad you guys came back to check us out. Hopefully you saw the video that we did about Sonos and we're helping to educate you on the smart home devices the best way we can. Today we are very happy to uh, introduce and welcome Mr. Theo Kalamarakis to the show, um, otherwise, otherwise known as the father of home theater. And I'm going to let you do the rest of the talking and bring us into this whole experience of uh, Rave of Home Theaters and the gaming situation we're going on. Uh, Theo, um, how should I call you? Theo or Theo? Not Theo, Theo. Theo. Just not this friend's name. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know. Theo. <laughs> Theo. Does anybody, only in Greece they call me Theo. Figure that out. I mean, I'm Theodore there. They okay. call me Theo as if I'm coming. It's so smancy fancy like I'm from France. I'm Okay. I'm okay. a guy from Brooklyn. When I first came to the States, I hated sticking out like a sore thumb and I was praying to God, God, why can't you give me a nice Brooklyn accent so I don't stand out? But, and to me, part of the whole exercise is meet people whose vision and passion and, and sense of direction can be harnessed to promote our common good, promote home entertainment. In my case, it's home entertainment. It's not Reva. It's how people experience home entertainment at home. And, at home. and that's not just movies anymore. It's gaming, it's uh, sports, it's concerts, it's karaoke. We have with this proliferation of uh, content, with the new vistas have opened for us to enjoy uh, our home in a much more meaningful way than we could have until recently with home entertainment being the glue. And I see, you know, Reva mostly as the wrapping paper about all this dynamic, about all these energies that are kind of scattered today. Can we fuel them in towards accessing the consumer in a way that benefits the consumer, benefits the industry and benefits the individual companies? That's our goal. Um, Reva is an extension of what I've been doing for 20 years in the custom design field. I started my career in 1990 when very reluctantly I got my first client that uh, wanted to do a theater and I didn't want to do it for him. Someone else kicked me in the rear and says, do it. And I said, I don't know how to do it. I never designed a theater in my life. And he said, you design your own theater at home. That person was Malcolm Forbes. I was working for him as an art director of, of, of American Heritage. So I said, I'll take the uh, client that read about me and wants a theater. What will happen? I will just do a bad job and I will go back with my tail between my legs to work at, at Forbes. But it didn't happen. I got the first job and, the, and I got a little bit encouraged. Uh, and then I got the second job and... At the third job, I said, I cannot do this thing. I cannot work as an art director in the morning and design theaters or pretend I design theaters at night. So I quit the job in 1990. It was January 1990 when I told me you have to incorporate because if you don't incorporate and you screw up, they're going to take your home. They're going to take whatever you have. They're going to take you to jail. So I started the company. It's, it, was, um, it was called Theater Design Associates. And... It's very funny, the second year of the company, of having the company, I started thinking designing custom theaters for clients that have the money is satisfying because you get to work with people that have unlimited amounts of money. But what if you can do the same thing for thousands of people at the time? So my idea of creating a package, a, cash, a, a cookie cutter, it's a bad word, but I used to do it, I used to call it this way. What if we were to do some recipe for theaters? So I don't have to do replic duplicate the recipe every time, and I don't have to be in front of the client every time a new client. So I created a, a product uh, with that company called Theater Design Associates. I'm embarrassed to mention the name of the product. It's, I look at it and I cringe. It was called Dream Palaces. I should have shot myself out of misery for calling a product Dream Palace. There isn't a tackier name. But anyway, we did it and we didn't have the recipe down pat because it was just designed. A room that could be built into another, into inside the room in the course of an hour, almost like Reva, a room that was built elsewhere, but without electronics. And that was the major flaw of the concept. Without electronics, just a room that's a design 
leave the consumer at the mercy of a custom installer that sometimes they don't know what they're doing, products that don't match. So uh, also I realized that although we went and, and installed these theaters to about 20, if not 30, early dealers of home theaters everywhere, Chicago, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, not one theater was sold. Why? Because the concept was still green. People used the room to make their presentation prettier. It wasn't a product that could be sold with the technology like we learn to do now. So it didn't go well. And I, a year later, I sold the company. It was nine, 2000, no, excuse me, 1993, to the company that was making these theaters in Chicago. It was a manufacturer called Ivan Carlson Associates that was doing exhibits. They're building exhibit designs for, for various people. So I sold the company. I'm not even a mess of how much I sold because it was nothing, but I paid off my only shareholder and as I was free to, to move on to do custom theaters. And I, I said, no, there is not enough market for packages. Let me do my custom job, which I did it for another seven, eight years. And then 1998, the bug of doing pre-designed theaters bit me again. I mean, I had not my lesson. And I got involved with Owen Scorning, which is a company that does acoustical installation material for, for, for builders. And they said, we own the builder's market. If you get a cookie cutter theater that could put, put in every builder's home uh, that we deal with, we're going to have a big success. So they financed this thing and I got, investors to put some money. We spent something like $77 million. It was an enormous amount of money. And for the second time around, it didn't work for a different reason this time. You have to try three times, see what it doesn't work every time. And then the fourth time is the charm. This is where we are now. So anyway, the problem that they had is they said, we have to make a theater that's no more than $40,000 in order to appeal to to lots and lots of clients that our builders have. So we we par partnered up with JBL. Who was the projector? Ronco, oh, maybe, no? Ronco, it was, it was, oh, it was so early that even Ram, Sam was not in the picture yet. No, it probably was Ronco. Anyway, packets, electronics, and designs that were developed um, at the headquarters of Owens Corning. Um, and we made a show, we presented the concept for the first time at the Builder Show in Atlanta. I think it was 2000, something around, it was before 2001. Because we closed that company, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the end before the, the plot is developed. Uh, we closed 2001. The problem was that some idiots, some marketing genius you know, in, in, in that company didn't figure out that if you want to put a theater, a $40,000 theater in a $300,000 home, that home typically has a bedroom for the kids, a bedroom for the parents, and a bedroom. What self-respecting parent will kick the, bed, the kids out of the second bedroom to put the theater? So nobody, there was no market for the theater. If they had aimed at a, at a house with three bedrooms, it would have been different story. So anyway, we, we closed the, the, there were no orders. People just, even at the price, they didn't beat. So I kind of um, pulled the plug in 2001 and went back to what I know how to do, custom design theaters. Uh, and then that continued from 2000, 2009, when the market collapsed and we saw fundamental changes in our industry, home theater had already become a commodity. And when people were hit with lower prices for homes and loss of income because of the cost of the stock market, not nationally, but internationally, the home theater became an afterthought. It wasn't mm -hmm. any more like a early adapters game that everybody want to have one because they want to brag to their friends themselves and their friends that they have a theater. So we saw a steady decline in home theater, which was not helped by our reluctance of our industry to promote it. Many younger people started coming aboard on the home theater bandwagon and because of the complexity of having 
to put together a theater. Home theater is not just putting two speakers on the wall, three speakers on the wall, whatever speakers, and, and, and coming up with design. You have to deal with designers, you have to deal with builders, with room isolation, all these things that make up a successful theater. And, and, and our industry was lazy. They said, that's too much. It's too much work for us. Let's just hang TVs on the walls and call it a day. A day. The losses were three, three, three plaques. They, in the graders, lost a big job because you don't make as much money as hanging uh, TVs on the wall. I like making, uh, selling theaters. The clients lost an opportunity to have an experience that's unique. And uh, uh, the industry primarily lost. Cinema, uh, Cinematech, all the chair companies stop selling the number of chairs that would have sold if you have the decade room. Screen manufacturers didn't sell as many screens, projector manufacturers. It's like a domino effect. So, but it was inevitable. The, the decline continued until 2011. Uh, we saw a diminishing of number of custom theaters that we sold. We used to sell up until 2008 about... Uh, uh, Sometimes 80 theaters a year. Uh, 80. I know, 80, 80. I still don't know how I did it. All I remember that we had like 40 people, half of whom I didn't know what the names were. Uh, I had three, four trusted architects that I kind of has the ideas, but it was not a way to make a living. It was too much chasing after the client, chasing to finish, chasing deadlines. But it was sort of a a relief when when the orders started diminishing because I could take a break and I can just start enjoying the movies that I was accumulating as a collector of movies. But anyway, um, around the 2011, something else happened, started happening. A younger generation of consumers stopped seeing, watching a movie in a theater as essential as it was for the parents. With the proliferation of iPads, iPhones, uh, portable medias, you saw more and more people getting tuned into watching a movie casually on the road. So when you keep doing it, that kind of urgency of training to watch theater on a big screen kind of dissipates. So almost we started atavistically to lose our connection with the experience of watching something on a big screen. Uh, but to me, that's the only way to watch a movie. Unless you see it big, with big sound, with a, a vision that is encompassed by the screen, you just don't get the same experience. So I said, it's our mission as an industry to educate the consumer of the difference that is watching a movie on a big screen on a dedicated room versus watching it on a, on a portable media. Uh, I tried to put together a call. I thought the, cha the change in the consumer would be to give them something that doesn't cost a million dollars to do a theater, like some of our projects. Give him something that give them some experience, some satisfactory experience, but it doesn't cost more than a hundred thousand dollars. So three years ago, I put together a concept and I to Vin Bruno at that point. He hadn't joined in CDA, but he used to work for Crestron, where I had um, a theater at the Experience Center. And I said, let me put a concept together where we tell the integrators, would you be interested if there was a theater that's available to you that includes everything, the design, the electronics for under seventy, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So we presented the class uh, it literally three years ago and it was the third disappointment. Two thirds of the people said, no, we're not making money from $60,000. I guess the people that that made the class are the people that are big companies that sell, you know, half a million dollar theaters and up. And they didn't realize that the strength in these numbers, if you, you can have a lot many more clients that buy a $60,000 theater than one client. And you can have a lot more scalable, scalable business model, sell, sell something that is not so expensive that you cannot sell more than one a year. So I, I saw people responding to the questions that this is not for us. It was like a test marketing that I was doing and Cynthia had helped me put a questionnaire that was sent in advance to the participants. And the writing was like, 
we don't want to sell anything that's under a half a million dollar theaters. Well, I'm on, I'm not interested in half a million dollar. Half a million. I've done, I've done it all my life. I want to see. Can you convey that passion about home entertainment to people that don't have the money, that don't have that kind of money, that may have the space, but they don't know how to do it. And you don't have the designers getting involved and, and messing it up or the integrator messing it up, giving them a solution that is pre-configured, easy to follow, just like when you buy a car. You don't buy a car, like I was telling to Rob, buy the, the wheels from one place, the chassis from another, the engine, give them an engineer solution. But they didn't want it. So I got out of the show and I bumped into Vin and he was talking with Andre Floyd, who was the marketing director of uh, marketing. I don't know if he's the marketing director. I don't know his title. Andre Floyd from Sony. And I said, I give up. I'm, I'm abandoning home theater. There's no way that I can just uh, continue to push something that people don't want. And both, uh, and they said, you just overreacting. There's a market there. You just we just have to find the right marketing approach, the right product, and reach out. And Vince says, you know, I was in Dallas for the vid for that show. I opened, he opened something like Craigslist or Angie's List and found out there were 800 integrators and uh, in register in the Dallas area. And he made a, a quick search and found out that out of 100, 800, not 100, five were CDM members. So he says, look at that. There is potential out there. There's a market. We need to bring these people to Cydia. We need to educate them. So a product that resonates with them, that makes it easier to sell something that they don't feel overwhelmed, is good for them, good for the consumer, good for Cydia. So let's just go and create something that is like a Trojan horse to this untapped market. And that's what um, prompted us to develop Reva. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. How many tests uh, did you make until you understand and mastery the, rela the relationship between the hardware you install and the acoustic of the room? Because a lot of homeowners, they just place the speakers and it's not working and they, they buy a good speakers. So how many tests, how long did it took you to understand the acoustic and the relationship with the hardware? I uh, will have to be honest with you and tell you that uh, we have consistently avoid having anything to do with electronics. Uh, I, when we do a custom theater, we're an architect. It's, we are doing the architectural environment, not the interior design. When you do a theater, there is the architecture, which is the spatial relationship of the design. And then there is the decoration, which Sometimes we don't do, we let designers to do. And then there is integration to technology. The only value that we bring into this chain of uh, people that work in a the theater is that we know what we do architecturally that might work with acoustics or might not work. We know not to put a nice looking sconce in the place where a speaker belongs, which is what happens with designers that decorate. They put things all over the place and then integrators pull their hair and said, how can I put the speakers? I want the speakers there. But the speakers don't look there. But it's not about looking good. It's about sounding good. So I see ourselves as the arbi over the years, an arbiter between designers and technology. We, and this, we, we created a language, we mastered a language that is supposed to keep the integrator and the client happy with how the technology is applied in the room and the designer happy with how their design kind of turns the room. We never install a theater because it is not our expectation. I see designing a theater, the same thing as, this, as directing a movie, which is my background. A director does not have to be a sound designer, cannot be a set designer, cannot be the lighting designer, cannot be the actor. It's the person that supervises the various trades that their individual expertise work together to create a unique result. So I see myself more, if not, not someone that has to do with technology or not someone that has to do with design, someone that understands the function of all these elements that create a theater and how we try to make it work. To your question, 
how many tests I have to make uh, to do a lot. At the beginning, I was very happy, like designers are today, to find the fabric that looked good. And I put it in front of an acoustical treatment. I would never put a, a bad fabric in front of the speaker. Like I have designers that put a nice leather cover over the speakers because it looks good. I, at least I never did that. But I did put in proper fabrics instead of treatments. I realized not on my own because I didn't go to a school, film school, but working with people in the industry like Tony Grimani, Steve Haas, uh, Sam Cavit, people that specialize in acoustics and working back and forth explaining my territory and learning about the territory, we kind of avoided having things that will have a negative impact on the house. So I learn by making, uh, again, mistakes on a different scale, but that's how you progress. You keep trying until you have a perfect recipe. And um, right now, we still fail. Everybody fails. Nobody knows everything. But the, the ratio of failure versus successes has been reduced to a very small percentage because there are not too many mistakes that you can make that you haven't made already and you haven't hopefully learned from them. During your answer there, you referenced a lot to, to movies and, and the word theatre um, definitely conjures up that image of, of a performance of, of a movie. Um, However, trends nowadays are seeing uh, the, the, the home theater, the home cinema being very much a multi-use space where uh, many members of the family are using it for activities like gaming, uh, maybe for workouts, uh, maybe for dancing, you know, and, and using it as a multi-use space. Does that, does that, affect, the does that affect the rule of cinema no. design? No. Do you have to be flexible no. for this? No. You have to incorporate technology intelligently. You have to make the room sound good. The treatments have to be what they're supposed to be. The equipment have to be where they're supposed to be. Uh, and you have to make this, the space inviting and exciting for whatever the use of the room is. Whether you play a game or you sound a movie, you wanna hear the sound crisp, clear, if you watch a movie, you have to have the sound coming from the voice of the mouth. You cannot just the speakers up on the ceiling and expect the voice to go. You have the same kind of principles. So to me, making the environment conducing to, to whatever you watch in the movie is number one. I see the theater, the design, nothing more than the wrapping paper around a Christmas gift. The theater is not a gift. The gift, the theater is what prepares you for what is going to happen in the room when the lights go down and the kind of room disappears. Another example that I use very, very often, a theater is a home theater, the environment. It's like the overture of a musical of an opera. It wets your appetite. It sets your expectations. When you go into the room, it has to grab you by the heart. But once the light go down, the room has to disappear. You cannot have bright rooms, rooms that reflect too much light, not to mention rooms that have bad acoustical treatments that, that can make the sound jumping all over the place. So your design, the room design has to kind of abide by the principle of good acoustics, but it's only until you sit down and watch a movie. If you watch a movie and you are conscious that the room has white fabric all around and you see the room before you see what's on the screen, you miss the, the point. Yeah, the, the the gift is the movie. The gift is the That's is it. the ex That's the it. gift is the experience, not the cinema itself. No, the cinema is only to whet your appetite, the appetizer to a great dinner. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. It's like you create this incredible environment, and and people are already amazed by what you're what you've developed. And then whenever you actually turn it on and you experience the film and the, the quality of the image that you're talking about, as well as the quality of the sound. It's like the caramel inside the chocolate, per se. Yes, exactly. The theater you'll experience for five minutes while you're taking a seat. The experience on the screen will be with you for two hours. So you have to prioritize it. You know, and what, what's so cool about what you're telling me is that <clears throat> there's a lot of details in, in, in what you're talking about, but, but you make it so easy. I mean, 
taking the size and dimensions of the room, I'm assuming that's that's what happens. Yes, of course. And there's uh, there's input on the style and the colors and the, the finishes that you would like. I'm assuming. Oops. But it all but it all comes in a package, and there's there's no hard thinking as far as placement and how it's supposed to look. It, it's ready to go. Tell tell me about that experience. Uh, that experience is something that we all aspire to, but it didn't, it, it exists with Reva for me now. That experience is constantly a custom experience up until now. It's not a scalable experience. And I'm sick and tired of having to reinvent myself every time you have a custom theater because after a while, you run out of ideas. I run out of ideas in a way that stop pushing myself to come up with something creative because there's only enough hours in the day and there's only so much you can do. So I came to a point where I said, I don't want to push myself to come up with something new for one person. I want to push myself to come up with something that might resonate with 10,000 people. To me, that's the incentive of moving from being, you know, an oligarch to being a Democrat. That's the difference of what you're looking for, for the very rich Russian client to do something that everybody with a $2 million or a $1 million home might be able to enjoy and afford. And to me, that's, a, that's the exciting part of Reva. It's, the, the, as I said before, the democratization of home theater. It's not anymore for the very wealthy producer in Beverly Hills. Anybody can be in their home and pretend that they're a powerful producer because they get the same experience, the same picture quality, the same sound quality if everything is properly arranged, like someone that has 2,000 times more money than them. And to me, that's, that's very satisfying. When I was a kid, I was dreaming to have a theater of my own. I didn't know how to do it because there was no money in the world. And up until 10 years ago, you needed all the money in the world in order to do a theater because it was trial and error, a lot of material, a lot of... Right now, the goal is how can we bring the prices down the same way the price of electronics have gone down. Right now, you get an Epson projector and you get better picture than you, what you used to get from a Ranco three-gun projector five years ago, uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> that we thought was the cat's meow. The technology has become so accessible. You get such a spectacular picture, you know, within levels, you get a little better, a little bit worse. But the average consumer with $15,000, and I know a lot of the high-end manufacturers will hate me saying that, you can get a pretty satisfactory experience that you couldn't get it before. And that is, to me, an incentive to package it with something that wraps the around the technology this is the room, the acoustics, the design that makes a complete package available for the first time in a lot of people that didn't have that option before. What you're telling me is that you're providing the end consumer with, with, with a quality package that they can trust. And as long as they have a capable you know, installer, they, they can take with confidence and install this complete package that's calibrated, that's custom, that looks finished and install it in a relatively quick amount of time. But Four be hours. Yeah, but, but, it, but be, can be confident that it's done correctly. You, you, there's not all that, that all that work, it's, it's time. And so all that time and all that effort, y'all are providing that. And that is what is part of the package. Yeah, Engineering so cool. that is being certified by the experts that we work in CDA, they will not allow us to put a projector with their own screen gain, a screen with their own screen gain using a projector that is meant to have a higher gain. You use a Sony projector. Sony projectors are not very bright. You have to use a screen to maximize the brightness. We have put this thing together so that no one can make a mistake. We protect them, not because I know it, but because we got a group of people that understand what it takes to put together a system. And dude, I was tortured when I was developing the Reva because I had 10 acoustics telling me, half of them, no, the speaker has to be three inches behind your ears. The other one said three inches in front of your ears. 
And then I said, you guys decide what you want to do. You are the experts. I'm going to convey your findings. And then we decided to go with the manufacturer specifications for each particular speaker. If you use Wisdom Audio, they have a different position of the speakers than what Triad does. So, because we're all about customization, we provide the specifications. We just don't let the in custom installer to improvise at the expense of the product specifications or at the expense of the client's experience. So these are all preparation work that took us two years. And uh, we continue to, to fine tune the recipe because the more manufacturers are involved with us, the more, you know, you need to kind of finesse the recipe. Yeah, that just gives me more confidence as a custom installer to be able to confidently deliver an investment of an experience to my client without, you know, it takes all that, that, yes. un, that, that guessing work, that unknown out of it. And also that it's, it's also hours of work that it has to take for integrators to put together a package that's already there. I have a lot of good friends, very high-end integrators, and they kept telling me at the beginning, what are you doing that we cannot do? We can do it all together. I said, you can do it and you won't make money and you can do something that's tested, that you can sell, that you approve and you make money. Keep doing it yourself if you think and keep being poor. So this is as simple as that. Creating a project that we don't, you don't require to have a, a degree, in, a PhD in order to put it together or to have 10 people to work together to design the acoustics, to design the simplement, to do the design of the walls. It's supposed to simplify this, uh, this process and make it profitable for the integrator so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Tell me, Theo, what, what's the journey for the, for the homeowner? How do they, do they find Reva and, and, and uh, begin this, the sales process or, or do you rely on, on dealers throughout the US? We haven't got there yet. I mean, as you probably, to reach directly the integrator, the, the installer, um, the client is a very expensive proposition. You have to do direct marketing, you have to put ads, you have to just spend millions of dollars to do it. So we decided to go with builders first because builders order in quantities. We have a builder that builds 150 homes. So originally our concept was, and it mutated over the course of the last year, start working directly with home builders. We found out that this is, this is not effective if we want to generate sales now. Builders have a long cycle. You sign up a builder, by the time they're ready to break ground, after they've decided to use the theater, it's a year. And by the time the house is finished, to come in that day and install the theater, it's another year. So we co accumulated orders from builders and they're waiting, they still do, until the house is ready. So our investor, our CEO says, hey, there's gotta be immediate sales. So we kind of turn around, again, the name of adaptability, and we became members of ASEAN, and we talk with a lot of dealers that have projects that are happening right now. And we found out that uh, some of these projects are much more immediate, so we tap into them, but the problem that we had in order to generate a lot of sales to maintain, you know, a company that spends a lot of money to develop and market the product, we did not have enough salespeople to reach out to these uh, custom installers and manage them. It takes a lot of management. You have to be on their face every day and, and tell them what happened to the client, where are the floor plans. And, and we have two people that are not enough to reach out uh, to a larger market. And Vin Bruno, who has been on our board of directors, uh, left CDN and became the president of Altec Pro. And um, he and our president, George Walter, who used to be with Digital Projection, said, let's try to reach distributors and manufacturers reps that will allow us to multiply a reach out to dealers. So we don't have two people calling into 10 dealers. We have 300 reps or 200 or 20 reach out to a lot more people. 
The problem that we have when we decide that that's the fastest way to generate more sales is that our packages included electronics, included three aspects, uh, chairs, electronics, and the design. We originally planned, and we still do it with dealers and, and designers, to sell the whole package. But we learned very quickly by reaching out to people from the industry that most of the dealers will not buy packages that they're not including equipment that have relations with the manufacturers, they get points, um, they have a personal rapport with Sony and Triad and everything. So we, the other thing that we want to do is to control the client, to have the client buy everything from one source so we guarantee to the client that we're not getting money and use them for cash flow and then we order equipment too late when the client needs it. So, but this didn't work. The, client, the integrator legitimately have a very personal relation with the client. They're not let us uh, interfere in this, even if it doesn't mean that we're taking any money from them, take money away from their profit. So we made a strategic decision, it's about five months ago, to create different packages for designers, that they don't have an uh, electronic uh, uh, integrator involved, we sell the whole package and they sell the client. For builder, we do the same thing. For integrators, we devise to design two packages. One, for those that don't have the staff to keep ordering 20 supplies, we give them the whole thing. The equipment are including the price at the same margins that if they were to get them themselves, 40 points typically. So, but we, we save them from having the accounting administration. But for most of them, and I would say 80%, they want to manage the electronics. So we said, fine. The electronics, if the package is $30,000 for design engineering, $30,000 for the chairs, maybe a little less, and 30 side for the electronics, we know the list of electronics. We then let it, don't let the client know how much the electronics are to avoid having, oh, I want a projector that is a little bit cheaper than that. We kind of sell it as a package, but we allow the integrator to sell the equipment themselves, take out this 30% 30 of the sale, so they sell it directly, so they have control and change the equipment, what they represent. And that's where Alltech Pro came to the picture. They represent electronics that may not, be in our, may not have been in the initial lineup. Sell them. And, and then you sell only the, the, the Reva bundle, which is the architectural plan, the customization, the acoustical treatments, the design, the lighting. And we even allow them to sell the seats. Some of them have very tight relations with manufacturers, Cinematex, Cinec. So we have three, three buckets, the Reva bundle, the bundle and the electronic bundle. Very interchangeable. If Mr. Installer wants to buy only the seats and the Reva bundle, we have a price, specific prices, such and such price to get this, such and such to get that. And if you want to have your own electronics, collect it from the client and keep it and order the electronics. And in order to simplify the process, we are creating a very, very smart configurator. It's an application that exists in iPad and an iPhone who will break the process into three components. Choice A, choice one, choice two, choice three. Number one, we have 12 templates of room of rooms. Based on room size, Mr. Client, when an integrator shows the configurator the client, you select template number three that has five chairs. Our packages come only with four chairs for a very specific reason, to maintain a fixed wholesale price and list price. Any extra chair, is an extra ink increment, it's a, it's considered an upgrade. So you select your room template, immediately the configurator adds, it's 68,000, let's say, for the basic system. It adds list price, 2,000 per seat. It adds three more seats, $6,000. Then you move to choice number two. We have three equipment packages, gold, bronze, and silver. Good, better, best. You select among the three. Very complete list of what's included to the cable, to the wire, but without prices, without the electronics, without naming what uh, the projector is, because you may want to sell an Epson and your other dealer want to say an Optima or whatever, uh, um, DP. 
and then you select the package, it's added to the price, and then you move on to step number three, select the design. My po pro point of I do Dreva is that I don't design the theaters anymore. I'm in a search of talented art sculptors, painters, uh, other artists who I curate their work. I find out work that I think can be adapted into a, a box of Reva and work with them to translate the artwork in something that is an eponymous artwork. Um, and, and we we use limited edition for some of the famous artists. We do 100 versions. So when you get the Reva theater with that particular theme, you get a plaque that says such and such number three of a hundred. So you get the client and the client that has a more of a more design oriented technology the opportunity to buy art that appreciates even if it goes down in price after years the art can be sold separately because we have a variety of us and because depending on the artist value and the expense of the artwork it it adds the third component to the price we have one artwork that is included in the price the publicized price 68 88 and 100 and something come complete with a with a particular artwork but if you want to upgrade to eponymous artwork depending on the artist you get an extra ten thousand dollars an extra twenty thousand dollars we have an artist her, her artwork adds seventy thousand dollars the product because her artwork itself when you buy it in a chelsea gallery is a hundred and twenty thousand so the client gets the same artwork but a low price so the three buckets. So integrators can have their own electronics as long as the overall package price fits into the price that we have. And they can provide the chairs as long as they have chairs. But if they want upgrades, we have a system of upgrades. Again, they consider if you want to get a better scenic chair or a better cinematic chair or a more a projector from Barco that has a different engine, that's an incremental addition to the price that the configurator does for the for the integrator or the builder. So in a five minute presentation at the end, a proposal spits out that has what theme you selected, how many extra chairs, what they look, and we have a configurator, uh, uh, we have an app that's attached to the configurator that you buy, you get from us a pair of goggles so you can actually walk inside the room that you just build and um, have a, a happy experience buying a theater. And are there, is there an opportunity for a homeowner to visit a showroom that has yes. some examples of the, the products? Yeah, we have the showroom in, uh, uh, in Valhalla and we're in the process of creating showrooms in other parts of the country and we are working with Alltech Pro to create and Rob to create opportunities for showrooms simply because we want people to be have something close to them to come to come and, and experience it because unless you see it on paper it sounds good but you really have to sit down and see what it is uh rob was given the presentation last week and um and he can tell us what he thought but yeah uh, they can come to a showroom and see it and then uh, with a dealer because if we do a client that comes to us on their own, although we don't market directly, the job will go to the nearest dealer. They're not gonna make the margins that they will make if they, if they sell it themselves, but they're getting paid for the installation, they get a bonus for taking care of the client, and as a bonus, they get to do anything else they want in the rest of the house of the client. We just got a job a big house in Mount Kisco the other day. And uh, the client came out to X directly, we sell a wisdom audio with one expensive theme, but someone was wanted to install it. So we got the local wisdom dealer rep introduced to the client. Not only he will install the theater, but he will make more money than the theater to do automation, lighting in the rest of the house. So. These introductions allow the, the in theaters that they didn't sell, that we make, allow the intro, the in, integrator to get to know the client and do whatever they like with the client. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that, Theo, as a, an installer of products that are very well known to consumers, products like Sonos 
or Logitech or Ring that we have a high turnover of those products. We don't, huh? um, yeah, we don't play a, a big. Um, it's not that important that installation. It's that opportunity to do more with the client in the future. Yeah. Um, so much. So yes, absolutely. I like I like that I like that uh, mentality that you're you're still you're giving that opportunity to dealers and and I think the packaged approach um, you know finish that complete it to a high standard deliver what the initial brief was and you will return. I, I firmly believe that you'll come back to that home and work again with that family. Absolutely. Stay here for a second. I want to tell you something. We created a, a design element that doesn't require the room to be precisely built to fit our design. Our designs, um, our rule number one is they don't touch the ceiling, they don't touch the wall, they don't, the front wall, the back wall, they don't touch the floor. So if the room is built two inches shorter, big deal. I used to work when I told you on Scorny. We lost two jobs because the theater, which is meant to fit snugly into the room, was three inches longer and it didn't fit. Or it was with a column that didn't fit to go down a spiral staircase. Everything that's here is supposed to be shipped UPS. All the big panels that you see on the wall in two parts, not only for that, there is another reason we did it. We want, if the client moves to another house, they can take the theater with them and the equipment rack. And a third part for this comfort is that when we apply for, for, for leasing programs to allow the consumer to buy the theater, the bank will finance this program because they can repossess it if the client doesn't pay the bill. But how do you repossess a custom theater that's all stuck into the room and you're not going to tear up the walls to take it with you? This is meant for, for portability and it opens up the door for getting uh, leasing programs applied when we're working on that. I, I love it. What is, uh, do you have like a favorite or is there one that, that people are really drawn to? Do they uh, like that? Uh, so far, uh, the steps is that comes for free with all the acoustical treatments that hide the speaker, and uh, uh, panels that hide the speakers illuminated properly. The others are a little bit more because they include royalties for the pictures. Theaters are all pictures of my theaters that I put there. But um, my favorite one, and the, by far the most popular one, if you go to limited editions, if you go up, is the origami. I, we can keep it on the shelf because it's easy, it's buildable, building blocks. The other illumination is very expensive. It's expensive. A, a, a gold package with illuminations goes up to $300,000. Uh, but origami is the one that day in and day out uh, people are drawn. We're in process of designing four more theaters. This is our weak point so far, not enough designs because it takes a while to develop them, to engineer them. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of having four new designers. Reva Roundtable. Reva Roundtable is all about home entertainment, not about Reva, except for my corner, which I use it to introduce new clients, like this one. Click at this beautiful lady, she's more beautiful than the theaters that it is for us. Uh, amazing artist, and she's a, she's a very renowned photographer. Um, keep up and you'll see. So I write about them. When I meet them, uh, I show her art, and further up, you're gonna see concepts of what I'm developing for them. This is a, a artwork that across a wall. No, here, stop, stop it here. And this artwork, you see the yellow dot on the left and the red, these are all raised plexiglass elements that dimensionalize her photographs. Click the arrow there to the right, the claim, as you see another design. So depending on, the, uh, yeah, you see what they develop. I see their artwork and I help them make the artwork pa panelized. This, pa this black and white photograph is four panels that are joined on the wall, creating uh, an acoustical treatment because a lot of acoustical treatments are hiding behind it and the speakers, but it creates a, a, a visual element that makes the theater look like the work of this particular artist. This guy on the other side, the guy the, the, on the picture on the right, I love this work. So I'm developing with him uh, 
plexiglass images of this artwork, which is very popular in Europe, back illuminated and bottom illuminated. So it depends on the artist. And, and I get inspired from the work. I know what can be applied in a room and then we'll go ahead and develop. And in the process, I write about it. We, we got crushed last week from social media because this lady is, is a very big celebrity in Europe. So she reposted the article in her <laughs> social media and we got inundated with people that wanted to read about it. So we use it for promotion. It's not, this is particular forever, but the other things in the round table is we direct the clients what to watch, what's good on Netflix, what what's on Amazon, what's good on Kaleidoscape. Not the typical things that you're gonna see in all the other reviews, the Star Wars and the, this, underappreciated stuff, underrated stuff that we want our readers to know. Uh, trends in technology, trends in home entertainment, gaming, and all that kind of stuff. So this, this is a great site for, for dealers to absolutely sh share in their newsletters, share this in their we social media posts. Yeah. More than anything else. We would also love to have interviews with the dealers now and then. We're actually developing our own podcast that is being led by John Saka and Dennis Berger, uh, covering topics that have to do with inviting industry figures, like what you do with me this time. Uh, Vin, to talk about the industry in general. You guys, to talk about subjects that, that pertain to you, that you're very uh, you know, passionate about. It's all about passion, it's all about creating a forum where people's passion and favorite opinions have a place. We don't want anything boring. We don't want to cover things that everybody else is covering. We just need voices of people that resonate with something that they love. And we want this love to kind of communicate through the blog or through our work in order to entice other people to, to, to get it involve home entertainment and understand what their options are i i read a story about you that you started as a filmmaker yeah um tell me why people love cinemas why people love stories why wh wh where does it come from for i, I want the i want the, um, the the opinion from a, a filmmaker is it maybe <sighs> What a, what a tough question this is. Yes, why, why people want to sit into a sofa and, and watch and enjoy a movie, a story that, that they didn't live, did the story of someone else. Because movies is a mirror of ourselves. We identify with people on the screen. That's why if you see a story that relates to you, you're being sucked into it, you enjoy it. And, uh, and, and movies are distillations of our human experience. And we relate to them. A movie as a companion to me is the same thing, the same thing as the companion that I get from a good friend of mine. I relate to that person the same way I relate to a movie that has something to teach me about human experience, teach me about myself, makes me think. That's why I'm, I'm an anomaly in, that, in the respect that I don't go to the movies to be entertained only. I go to be excited, to be provoked. Um, I, there is one particular expression that a lot of people use that gets on my nerves. Uh, it was very depressing. depressing. And I'm, I want to tell them, and who the, the hell do you think you are that um, my role is to entertain you? Depressing is part of the human experience. If I do something that is not uplifting, does it mean it doesn't belong to human experience? Movies are supposed to be a reflection of what goes around the world. And that is what, to me, is the appeal of the movies. It makes me think. It makes me think about things that I didn't think about me. It educates me, it enlightens me. It li and that's why I like independent movies, and I like foreign movies. I do enjoy an occasional Hollywood epic. I don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I see them because I don't know what everybody else is, uh, is um, you know, raving about. But I, I prefer, if I'm by myself, I prefer to see something that is quiet, 
thought provoking, has a good story, good characters, and 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 directed and scripted intelligently without insulting my intelligence. <laughs> Well, Theo, I, I definitely think that you've you've uplifted this room, you've uplifted this conversation, and you've created an experience for our viewers and listeners. Um, where can people find you then online, social media, websites? Yeah, if you read the blog, uh, Theo's Roundtable, often you will see my corner. I can't on whatever crosses my mind. Uh, I also have a Facebook page. I have a LinkedIn page. You can give my address. I have no problem with putting it. Theo at theo.kalomirakis at reva.com. We'll put the link below. I yeah. think um, someone you... wants to send me. If I write something, what I love more than anything else, people logging in and making a comment. Yes. Uh, I think the Rave Around Table is the best place to, to, to put Yeah, you. that leave a comment. So Theo, we, we will definitely have you back on the show. Um, yeah. There's a lot more to to talk to you about. Um, I think we're running up on our time today. 6.20. Uh, oh, I told you, you can't shut me up. Not ask it again, but I wanted to go back into that for a minute because one of the biggest lessons of our, not my lifetime, but is Henry Ford with the assembly line. I mean, he created such an experience for average Americans to be able to drive an automobile. And I, re I relate that to what Theo's doing where you're taking something that has all these different pieces, as Theo said in my video, and I've video you talked about the you get a wheel from Mercedes you get a seat from Ford and to be able to put that all together for the dealer is such an incredible experience for the dealer but also again for the end user which is the homeowner that we're, we're talking to here um, and you have the father of home theater putting that vehicle together but talk about vehicle can I take you a very last comment in nine, two, 1996 I had my first book which was called private theaters and Roger Ebert wrote the, uh, the introduction, because uh, I had done a very bad looking theater for his house. And the, it started the introductions, Henry Ford wants to put a T-Mobile in your garage, Theo wants to put the home theater in every house. <laughs> and I remember still this, this quote still resonates. <laughs> I just think it's awesome because you, we all, I mean, I'm not criticizing our industry. I'm just saying that I, there are very few people I think have experience like Theo in the home theater. And for a local dealer to take on this uh, task, thinking about that, he might have the projector down, he might have the screen down, but to have the design, to have the seats, to have the carpet, the to have the acoustics, right. To, and now we're looking at these artists that Theo's going around the world and, and capturing. I don't think there's an easy way to put together a theater and, and give that home it's owner impossible. the experience. I'll tell you that, it's impossible. That they're getting myself, in the man. three buckets that Theo keeps referring to. And if you could just tell us those three buckets, Theo, because you seem to take the budget and divide it equally among the buckets instead of the dealer saying, well, I'm going to give him a really good picture and so-so sound and not that good of a uh, visual, right? No, so those no, three yes. buckets. I get this. Uh, the room, including the seats, the electronics and the design. The room includes electron uh, includes acoustics and design and seats. The electronics package includes the electronics and the design includes what's going inside the room. These are the three buckets. At the optimum levels that you've set in those three different uh, price packages, right? Yes, exactly. Everything, everything's good. It's not you can get good this and not that good that. I, I think it's an important message. And I can't good talk in every category. It just gets more refined as you go in a higher category. Yeah, I love it. I can't get enough. All right. All right. I think a, a vibe that I'm picking up just to, just to end. Um, I see a brand here that's, that's ready to create a new culture, a new culture in the, the installation of technology in people's homes, a dealer culture um, that I think is going to go across many countries. Um, and it shouldn't be underestimated that by getting involved with the culture at Reva, you're going to be involved with with the forefathers of home cinema, um, pioneers of this packaged cinema system. I think it's, it's an exciting journey to go on if you're a dealer. I would really encourage people to investigate further for their business. That's... I think it'll easily resonate with the dealers we're talking to because they believe in what you do, Chris Gamble. You turned me on to the one day smart home. JJ with um, you know, siloing, which is system local. 
We could talk about that in another show, but the Raver Theater just fits into that package and that pattern. It's awesome. It, it does. Right. And, and that's, what, that's what I see the most value for me is, is the confidence that I can deliver. An, it's an investment for our end user that I can confidently deliver them a quality pack that looks good, that sounds good, that's purposeful, and something that they're truly going to use and enjoy using. So, Jay, that, that, Jay, I'm sorry. Can I continue? I want to just... No, uh, go ahead on. No, I just... The only real challenge we all have is education. Education that starts from me and goes to you, and then from you is conveyed to the end user. This is still a, in progress. I don't think... I had it in my mind up until a few months ago, and then we put it on paper. And once we put it on paper, things opened up. People got it. They didn't think of it as a service anymore. They thought of selling a product. And that was a fundamental change in approach. But with the responsibilities come obligations. We need to distill the message, not to the consumer, but between us. Uh, we have to provide the manual that allows the dealer to completely get it. Whether it is question and answer, or whatever. I'm developing this manual. George showed it to the team at Alltech Pro. To me, it's still very loosey-goosey. I want to tighten it and tighten it and tighten it. I mean, to me, this is more exciting and will be more useful than designing for other designs because it's all has to be as simple as buying a cabinet from Ikea and opening up the manual and getting a screwdriver and putting it yourself. I'm oversimplifying it, but the closer we get to that simplicity, the closer we get to this lack of fear of complexity, the, the more we're gonna change the industry. It's always difficult. You know, I did the collection for Disney a few years ago and it was it was supposed to go through furniture stores. Furniture stores freaked out because it included technology, and the, and and Disney and myself made a mistake and imported technology from China instead of going with a legitimate manufacturer. Maybe it would be a little bit more, but definitive technology would be behind the speakers or Sony would be behind the manufacturer and address concerns about technology or defects or anything. We did it there and we didn't, we couldn't, we failed the furniture industry because we didn't provide them good support. Right now, what we do, it involves everybody, it involves manufacturers, we take care of their part, we take care of our part, acousticians take care of their part. It's a consortium, it's a synergy of expertises that work together with one goal in mind, to give the consumer something that will not fail that easily. It's awesome. Okay, on that note, Theo, I would like to extend a very big thank you to you for, for joining us on the show. We're looking forward to editing this and getting this out on our YouTube channel, Facebook page. Thank you. Rob, do you want to close up with how to get in touch with the, the home tech experience? Um, go ahead and wrap it up, Chris. You know that. Okay, guys, you can find us on all social media platforms. Look for the hashtag, hashtag HomeTechX. Our handles on social media is at HomeTechX. We've made it so simple for you to find us. Look for the hashtag, tag it to your, your posts, share with us images of your home theater. We want to see your, your media rooms. We want to see your, your, your surround sound systems. Uh, we want to see you enjoying movies, music, gaming, dancing, yoga, whatever you do in your media room, share it with us. We'll share it with Theo. Um, can, I, can, and, I make, can I suggest something? You, may, you brought something very good. Uh, we're contemplating having a, a column in the, on our blog, similar to the one that I had for Sand and Vision. Ask Theo, if you can go and collect images of media rooms, I can review them and I can just select one a week and write a, a post about it and put it on our blog and then there you go that's it that's it we'll, also, we'll get that I in motion would, i would love to get your uh, this segment on our blog and our website and in our social media so we can kind of bring more people to you and let people know what we're doing because that was amazing i mean your questions your passion was we're family 
No. This is good. This is good. Well, we're definitely going to speak to you much, much more, Theo. Um, yes, so, yeah, again, big back. thank you for me, guys. Do you want to thank, thank Theo and I'll we'll close thank, it up? Thanks, thank thanks very much, Theo. Thank you very thank much. You. Well, rave a round table for everybody at home. Rave a round table. Visit that, uh, dot com. And thank you, Theo. Very nice to get to, thank get to you, know you and uh, hear more about what you have going on. We're going to see a lot more of each other, I promise you. Absolutely. Good All right. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah, thank you. It's a wrap. Bye. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Theo. Should we ask our questions now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we did two questions on that list, the whole list, two. <laughs> Dude, I don't. Why were we here? Rob? Yeah. <laughs> he can talk for hours. He's great. That was awesome. Sure.